Welcome back to the Bernard Lee Poker Show. We're very fortunate to have this guest on. I have known this gentleman for a number of years. He's a bracelet winner back in 2011. He has won over $9 million in career earnings. He also, back in 2007, won the Doyle Brunson Five Diamond uh, Championship, also for $2.5 million. He is the all-time leading money winner for Ukrainian uh, poker players. And this gentleman uh, went through a harrowing experience during the invasion of Ukraine and has been on media outlets such as Fox News talking about his experience. I'm so glad that he is safe. And I'm so glad that he's able to share his story with us here on the Bernard Lee Poker Show. Welcome to the show, Eugene Katerloff. Eugene, thanks for joining us, I believe, once again on the Bernard Lee Poker Show. Yeah, thank you, Bernard. Yeah, Bernard, and it's, it's good to be back. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a wild ride, uh, all starting from poker in Ukraine and leading to what's happening there now. So um, yeah. happy to kind of bring light to this. Yeah, during the whole process, I was thinking about you a lot. I DM'd you on Twitter back and forth and wasn't sure and I would have totally understood if I didn't get any reply. But, man, you were really on Twitter a lot, helping the world kind of experience it firsthand. And uh, you, you replied back. And I was really I was happy and pleased that you were safe and, and uh, going through that experience. Um before we get into it, and I'm very excited to understand it, and I think a lot of my listeners will be excited to understand what it is, is that I'd love to kind of understand the history of everything, um, because in some respects, and back then it wasn't the Ukraine, it was still part of uh, the Soviet Union, part of Russia, you were born there and had to leave what is now the Ukraine, but was part of uh, Russia back then, right? And so I'd love to kind of hear that background first, uh, talk a little bit about your poker, obviously, exploits, and then go into what, what happened. So kind of what happened when you were a youngster? Sure. Um, yes, I was born in, uh, in 1981 um, in, the, you know, in Kiev, which at that time was uh, part of the Soviet Union. Um, my parents uh, were, my dad personally, like he hated the Soviet Union. He was always kind of looking forward to escaping from there as my, you know, he just hated, commu you know, communists and um, he always kind of dreamed to, to be able to have the chance to leave. Um, so, you know, I think when we had the opportunity, um, we left, my dad actually left in 1989 and my mom and I had to stay behind another year, year and a half. And then we left in 1991. But it was still, we actually left on the day the Soviet Union fell apart, which is kind of wow. crazy. Um, but yeah, but basically we were, we were uh, leaving the Soviet Union and um, going to live, uh, going to live in, you know, immigrating to, to the U.S. Um, so, you know, that was, that was a whole kind of uh, hectic uh, process. You know, my, when my mom and I, my mom, you know, when we were leaving, I know she sold all her things. And, you know, when we were uh, immigrating to the U.S., she had a total sum of uh, $56. Uh, wow. to, to her name and uh, yeah there were some interesting stories like when we were like on the plane and we were flying through Ireland I believe um, uh -huh. uh, and at the airport I remember I asked my mom for a can of coke because I never had a coke I never had a coca-cola and it was like one dollar so and you know my mom was like uh all right I'll get you know I'll get it for you <laughs> but it was like you know <laughs> two percent of your net worth right 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 <laughs> coca-cola right right, 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 right. <laughs> so, make sure you hold on to this and drink it very slowly <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah just enjoy it yeah exactly <laughs> right right that's um, fantastic so, and then you know coming to the u.s was was kind of you know kind of a shocker i was i was 10 years old but um you know it was definitely harder for my parents than it was for me um learning the language you know everything kind of getting adjusted to to life um, making new friends, you know, it was, it was, it was a process, but it, you know, uh, it took a couple of years and then we got used to it. Um, and, um, uh, so yeah, I just kind of grew up. I started, you know, I remember at some point at 12 years old, I, 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 I switched over from thinking in Russian to th thinking in English. So English okay. became kind of my, my right. natural language. Um, right. I kind of, I started to forget actually a lot of, uh, a lot of Russian, um, and uh, yeah, I went to school, went to went to university. I was uh, I was into trading, and and then I got into poker. I got into poker, and you know, kind of when the poker boom started in two thousand three, um, with with friends from from uh, from high school, and 
um, and uh, and and you know all throughout college and yeah then I and I kind of you know launched on my poker career and I would say maybe like 2004 2005 when I started see you know started seeing success um, I decided to go pro and you know had had quite a bit of success um, and then in 2000 and um, was it 2011 uh i i i i was I, I was player of the year in that in that year at poker and um i remember daniel on the ground it was always pushing me because you know we were fr- we were you know kind of good friends and he was pushing me to uh to, to join poker stars at the time he was like why don't you join you know you know you'd be good for the team and and i was like yeah sure okay well, you know why not let's try it out and, and then like he was like oh you just need like you know you need like a big win on your, you know on your belt and i remember in 2011 was the first year that they had the first 100k in the bahamas and you know so i played that and um and i went with daniel heads up and i beat daniel heads up so it was like it was like it was like it was like straight out of a movie you know like right 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 you right. could you couldn't write a better story right so uh so it was just it was, it was it was great and he was really happy for me and you know and then i signed with poker stars and i started to um represent ukraine uh because mm-hmm. because i came kind of came, you know came out of kiev and um they want you know poker stars asked me you know if i'd like to represent Ukraine and wear their flag, wherever I go and, you know, spend, you know, about a month and a half out of the year in Ukraine. And I was kind of happy to, because I was already um, spending quite a bit of time in Ukraine with my dad, you know, for, you know, over the previous 10 years, I would go for, you know, spend the summer there, you know, my dad, had a lot of friends there. So, you know, starting from the around the year, from the late nineties, we started visiting, you know, Kiev again. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so I didn't mind kind of spending time there. You know, I, I always, you know, love the country it's still, you know, I still, you know, still felt like home in some way, even though it's, you know, from a, just a childhood. Um, so yeah, so, you know, I joined, I joined, I joined poker stars at the time and, and started spending even more time in Ukraine and, you know, and, um, kind of reconnecting with my roots a little bit. My Russian was actually really poor at that time. Right, uh, I, I was going to ask you. I, yeah, I was yeah, going to ask you because you I, said you started losing and forgetting the Russian. How how quickly did it come back? Exactly. So so I, I did. I mean, I certainly didn't forget all of Russian. It's just it was really difficult for me to speak like fluently. Like I would always mix in English words because I would forget. You know, for, and I didn't know Ukrainian at all because I you know I never I never I never learned it right. at the time when I left. We only spoke Russian uh, in Kiev. Um, so uh, yeah. So basically. Uh, then, then I met my my wife, and spending more and more time in, in Ukraine. I met my wife there in 2014, and um, we we started living there uh, from 2015. Um, you know, and then just my Russian became better and better and better, just for, with practice. So, so now mm-hmm. I'm you know I'm kind of back to being mostly fluent uh, in 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 Russian as much as I was uh, as much as I am in, in English. Um, so yeah, so in about 2015, I I actually moved back to Kiev. Um, you know, my wife has a, has a growing bit of brand and business there. And, um, and I found, you know, uh, together with Luca Pagano, who was, you know, also, uh, you know, basically the Italian champion and the Italian representative for, for broker stars at the time. Um, uh, we, we founded clash, uh, which is, uh, an e- esports team and event organizer. Um, so it kind of made sense for me to stay in Europe. Uh, then, you know, a few years later, uh, I think it was in 2000. Um, I also joined, uh, I stopped being Poker Stars Team Pro in about 2016 or 17, I believe. And then I joined uh, Poker Match, which was uh, a local uh, site in Ukraine. It's the largest uh, poker operator in Ukraine. And so, you know, I was still kind of, even though I wasn't playing poker professionally anymore, I was still, um, you know, kind of making appearances and, and playing some poker here and there. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I do still enjoy the game very much, but that's kind of, that's kind of where my life was, um, you know, mostly how, kind of working big, on the company and, you know. Yeah. How big was it, you know, let's talking a little bit about poker is that how big were you as a name in the Ukraine, right? I mean, like people, it, it was still growing and poker stars were trying to get there and, and, and poker matches. It sounds like you, you were growing. How big was it? Like, in other words, if, I, I'm I'm making the assumption that you could walk down the street in Ukraine and it's not like your mom, yeah. right? So, but no, but but not if you to that degree, poker, yeah, yeah. But but in a poker setting, I would assume that people were like, "Hey, that's that's Eugene Kachalov." Yeah, I would say I'm the I'm for sure the, the most famous um, poker player in Ukraine. I mean, I'm you know the biggest winner in Ukraine, and and certainly like when in Ukraine, whenever whenever there were like poker circles, <laughs> in poker circles, I would get kind of mobbed, and and people right. all, all right. these people recognize me. So, um. 
you know, <laughs> I guess in Ukraine, you could say I'm like the Daniel on the ground or the Phil Helmuth in Ukraine. Right, uh, right, you, right, you, right, you, right, right, right. You, right. you can put it in those terms. Yeah. Um, so certainly, and the game has been, you know, poker was growing really well in Ukraine. And uh, I always had hope for growing live events in Ukraine at the time, because uh, um, I think it's just a great place for a number of reasons. Like, like the people are very friendly. Uh, it's very cheap. Uh, and Kiev was um, like very tourist friendly. It's, 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 it's inexpensive and it was easy to go to like, you don't need visas or anything. So it was just easy to go for from all over the world. So I always supported kind of, uh, I was always hoping to bring back like international poker tournaments um, into Ukraine, but it was always difficult with regulations. But then like a year ago, they actually, you know, they regulated like gambling and, you know, poker. So it was, it was actually coming back and we had a really nice live event that was run uh, just a few months ago um, in Kiev. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously before, before recent events, um, right. you know, th that's kind of where I was focused on, on my company clash with Luca Pagano mostly. And, and then also kind of, uh, being an ambassador for, for poker match and doing my best, um, to, to grow poker. Um, and I, I never, I mean, I, while I don't play poker professionally, I still like absolutely love the game. And I, and I, sure. and I always, my dream was always to kind of play it, recreate, go back to playing it recreationally. <laughs> right, 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 right. Which is so funny to hear because so many people, so many of my listeners right now are like, that's what we do. We do recreationally, but yeah. it is such a great sport to continue to play. And, and obviously there, and, and again, I, I just really want to make sure people who, are listening. Um, the show is about to celebrate its 15th anniversary, the Bernard Lee Poker Show. And I think that people who have just started listening over the last several years, you may not understand or, or know this name, but Eugene Katsilov was one of the best players in the world about 10 years ago. Um, $2.5 million in 2011, player of the year. Um, 2007, won over 2.5 million. As I said, won a WPT for over 2.4 million, a WSOP bracelet, multiple caches. I, I'm talking dozens of caches in the World Series. This was a player that was plastered everywhere for about two or three years in the world of poker. You go on poker news, card player, everywhere this person was. Um, has been on our show talking about his achievements. Forget what, what we're about to talk about. So really want to put that in perspective for people who aren't. And by the way, everyone has Google. Go look him up. I mean, you'll know who he is. Um, he's being a little humble as he quickly just glanced through his poker world. It, it, we could do a whole show just about that. Um, but we're very pleased that we can talk about his experiences as well um, during uh, the invasion, unfortunately, uh, of Ukraine and his kind of escape uh, from, from that situation. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're talking with Eugene Kachaloff here on the Bernard Lee Poker Show. And you moved back, like you said, to, to the Ukraine. You've been living there for a while. You met your wife there. Is that right? Yeah, it's a, it's a long story, but yeah, w w through 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 different friends, uh, yeah, I met my wife, and and you know we start we she traveled with me while I was still playing poker professionally for a couple of years, and then she's like, I, we need to settle down somewhere because we're living like, you know, we're basically like like homeless. We're just like moving right. from hotel to hotel to right. hotel. So it's like right, right. It's, it's 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 hard to live like that. You know, it's it's of fun course. for a little while, but it's it's you know it's, it's real easy it's, when it's you're single. Long term, it's real simple when you're single. Yeah. <laughs> Like, and, oh, and it's the also next place we're gonna go <laughs> and it also sounds cool for people who haven't done it but but as anything you know when you do too much of it it kind of gets old and it's actually really nice to have a home to go back to like a home base you know so yeah yeah so so basically our, we decided to make our home base in, in in kiev at the time i never imagined that i would live in kiev but but my you know because of my wife's business and because of my you know me wanting to stay in europe uh you know i lived there and, and i fell in love you know with uh with with the country with the city and and, and with the ukrainian people um, to be honest, and even though I didn't really feel like I was kind of back home because I, you know, I, uh, um, I still felt like more, more, more of an American. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm only an American citizen. You know, um, I was, I never became like a Ukrainian citizen or anything like that. Um, but it's still, I still kind of fell in love with the country and with the people, and uh, really kind of looked forward to living there for a long time. Um, so, when did you officially yeah. settle in at, in in Kiev? I, th I think it was 2000. 2015, I believe. Okay, great. So, so then, as obviously, you're very attuned to the uh, the the political situations, etc. Around what time 
you know, within the last several months, within the last year or so, when, did, you know, I'm sure you've heard grumblings and there's always going to be grumblings, but when did it start getting uh, to become a situation of this could become serious and we need to be prepared? Yeah, I mean, certainly it, it, the tension was, was you know, uh, coming up and up and up over, over the last, I, don't know, I, I guess I would say six months or so. Um, but still like, no one, no one really thought it would come to an actual invasion. No one thought that there would be like tanks rolling in, uh, at least into like towards Kiev or, you know, or towards any of the major cities. No, no one thought that. Like, I think the most that, that everyone was kind of thinking was like, maybe they would just, you know, try to do something in the Donbass area, like the very east uh, of Ukraine, kind of where there was already uh, a frozen conflict. Um, but no one, no one thought, no one thought it would get this bad. Um, so you know, even even with the with the U.S., you know, uh, kind of kind of sending out warnings that you know invasion is imminent. Um, you know, at the time, I don't know. I, I I would how do I put this? Um, there there were so many things over the last couple of years that that the U.S. government, in my opinion, you know, kind of gotten wrong where they kind of cried wolf and they've gotten wrong. So it, it, you know, I didn't just naturally like lean towards believing them. I, I was like trying to listen to other sources. And I, and I was trying to like look at other, not just sources, but just, uh, you know, other data points. And I remember like one of the data points I was looking at is for example, like even though the US embassy, you know, evacuated, like the Chinese embassy didn't evacuate. And I was like, well, the Chinese are so close with Russians. So they have their people in Ukraine. Are, is Russia really gonna bomb, you know, Kiev when there's like Chinese citizens and embassies and, you know, politicians, like government officials there? Like, I don't know, just like little things like that. So I was like, I, I, I still felt like it was unlikely. Having said that, I still I still uh, thought it's probably prudent to prepare uh, in case I am wrong. Um, so I would say uh, probably early February, late January, early February, um, my wife and I started talking about, you know, just uh, we said, OK, well, let's make sure to always have our uh, car with a full tank of gas. Like never, never let it, you know, just think, because in case something happens, we knew we were probably we have go. to like just drive. We just have to drive drive uh west towards some border um and we said you know let's um let's make sure we have all the most important valuables like in one place at home like in the book bag so we don't have to like you know freak out like you know the paperwork like passports maybe jewelry maybe some cash uh you know whatever it may be just so it's kind of in one place um so at least that that was kind of that was kind of ready so even though i thought chances weren't high that an actual like invasion of such a scale would happen you know i thought it's prudent to 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 be ready just in case um, and actually, you know, interestingly enough, the, the night before the invasion, we actually got together with our friends and we were planning to, we were thinking about maybe renting some place on the west coast of Ukraine just to kind of sit it out, just not to be in, you know, in, in, in city centers. And we were thinking, well, maybe we'll go there during the weekend and spend like a week there. So we were kind of like thinking what, what we would do in case uh, uh, shit hits the fan, essentially. Um, but uh, that, so that, was, uh, that was Wednesday night. And then we go home. I remember we went home at around 1 a.m. I remember I filled up again our, 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 you know, our car. We go home. Uh, we were, but, you know, tension was really ratcheting up at that point on the news. We, you know, we didn't know what to expect. The tension was definitely ratcheting it up. And then I remember I, I, I went to sleep. I fell asleep at around 2 a.m. And then I remember at 4 a.m., I remember 4.30 a.m., I woke up. With like a distant sound of an explosion and i was like i don't know what that is and i kind of i was like really sleepy and i fell asleep and then an hour later my wife her phone starts going off and um her friends were calling her you know and then she picked up and and it's like it's happening and you know basically tanks are rolling in through the borders and um i mean i still get goosebumps talking about it but it was like we just you know jumped out of bed and um you know just made ourselves coffee and we're like well um let's call you know call our friends you know kind of we had like a we had like a uh, a plan to meet uh, just outside of Kiev. There was uh, our friend's uh, parents had a home in uh, uh, 35 kilometers, uh, about 20 miles outside of Kiev, uh, south uh, southwest of Kiev. Um, so we said, okay, let's 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 go there uh, before before the, you know the, the, before kind of any kind of panic starts uh, in, in you know in Kiev because you gotta you gotta understand like. For people who haven't been to Kiev, it's a it's a city of like four or five million people. You know, it's a massive, it's it's a huge city, um, you know, huge metropolitan city. Um, and so we just quickly started packing our bags. We got as much stuff as we could together, like literally just a few things, like like just some sports clothing. I was thinking, I just took like some sneakers. I took some 
boots in case I needed to like, you know, walk in snow. Um, you know, we didn't know what to expect. Um, so just a few, threw a few things together, took, took the, the, you know, the valuables that we had, you know, prepared and, and, and just left and stopped by my wife's office. And already at seven in the morning, we were outside and you could see there was panic starting to, you could just see like people are kind of running around. You could see pe people's faces have changed. There's more people on the streets than there are normally at that time of the, you know, in the morning. Um, and you see people like, you know, rushing around with suitcases on streets, you know, like everywhere, you know, and, and traffic starting to pick up. Um, so we were able to get on the highway. There was already some traffic, but it wasn't that bad yet. Uh, it took us uh, maybe two hour, two and a half hours to, to drive the 20 miles. So still traffic -y, but not, you know, not, not, not awful. Um, and we were able to meet with our friends at, you know, at their parents, uh, at their parents' place. And, you know, they, they took us in, it was, you know, wonderful people. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and already at that time, you know, all we're seeing is like, uh, on TV is like missiles landing and we heard like bombs going off, you know, in the distance. It was, it was very, very scary. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, like I even, I already, like I have some memory of it, but like the feeling of that fear you, and that unknown like what's going to happen you, you do kind of you do kind of forget um and you have to make and and, yeah. and you know what what when i'm watching a lot of your social media and, and listening to some of the other interviews is that i think people have to understand you have to you know it's, it's so easy to monday morning quarterback you should have done this and you should have done that but you're yeah. in the moment and every decision you make you have to think for the future and and we'll talk about the the gas situation and all of that in a second but like You've got to make these decisions and you do as much planning as you, you know, it's, it's ironically, it's kind of like a poker tournament, right? Like you think of all the strategies you possibly yeah, can yeah. do. And then all of a sudden, what's the most the plus hand, EV? What's the most, right, the right. Most the hand EV is EV. out and now you're going to make a decision for except, your, except, your except tournament. the downside is not money. It's life. It, it's life. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say like, yeah. the, the worst is you lose a tournament. This one, you could die. Like, I mean, so like, exactly. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's analogous, but not really, you know, but, but it's yeah, very yeah. interesting, but you, you know, in, in the scenario you if people have to think about we we haven't been through that and I'm, the majority of the people who are listening to this have never been through that situation where it's life and death and you really have to make like should i go should i not is this going to be that bad what are we going to do you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and um uh, before we get into the actual journey well, uh, one of the questions i wanted to ask was what about all those other people who couldn't get out like your friends parents are they still there or did they were they able to get out as well so before before I answer that, like it's interesting. I just want to like, you said something really interesting, like that, that people can't appreciate like what that feels like, and, and right. that's actually one. Of, well, that's actually one of the main reasons when I saw that change within me, when I saw that kind of like that animal instinct, you know, kick in, like you know, the, the survival instinct kick in. I was like, wow, it's. I just kind of noticed it within myself. I was like, it, it, wouldn't it be, you know, uh, I thought the least that I can do is at least expose to the world you know, kind right. of what I'm going through, you know, through my eyes, you know, I have, you know, I have, a, you know, a significant Twitter following. So I, at least I can bring some attention to this, you know, maybe that, that's, maybe that's, that's what I can do with my, you know, with, uh, uh, um, with, uh, um, uh, maybe that, like, that's the benefit that I can bring in such a horrific situation. I, I felt sure. like, so I was like, why don't I share uh, what I'm going through? So, so be, be, and I remember I actually, when I, you know, later on when I did get into Europe and I saw people kind of walking around and just like holding hands and smiling, it was so like surreal for me because I was like, oh my right, God, right. like people don't realize what we went through, but but you also can't blame people because you can't, sure, like until course. you actually feel it for yourself, you can't, right. you, don't, you don't know. So so I just wanted to, to kind of point no, that no, out. I, because I, I, think that, I, think, I, I think that that's really important why. And I think that, like you said, that's why it was so gr great is the wrong word, but that's why it was, you know, real. we were able to live in your shoes for just a small period during that social media time. I mean, I was, I, I mean, I was looking at it constantly, yeah. reading it and thinking it to myself, you know, again, ironically, like a poker scenario of like putting yourself in those shoes, what are you going to do? Like, you know, when you're watching all these on YouTube or watching it on WPT or WSOP, like, would you make the call? Would you not? Would you move all or whatever? Okay, now let's bring it to real life in this scenario. Like, what do you do? Like, how would you think? Oh my goodness. Like, what, you know, what, what are you going through driving 20 hours? Are you going to run out of gas? You know, it's just such a, uh, mm -hmm. an experience that I felt, you know, like, oh, you know, this anxiety all the time. That's kind of what, what led me to DM you like, you okay. <laughs> like, because yeah, I'm yeah, feeling yeah. it. I mean, I don't know what you, what you would be feeling it before we get into the whole story. Why don't we take a break? 
and then we'll get into literally the entire journey. Uh, and it was an incredible story. If you have, for, for people who haven't heard it, go on Twitter, uh, go on Eugene's uh, Twitter, uh, which is Eugene Kachalov, K-A-T-C-H-A-L-O-F. Go on there and go back to the OV. OV, I'm sorry, OV, I said OV. OV, um, go back to February 24th and follow it. Uh, there is such a huge chain of exactly what happened. But when we come back, we're going to talk more with Eugene about his journey uh, to uh, after the invasion happened when we returned here on the Bernard Lee Poker Show. <laughs> 